I am the uh, CMO here at the Globus Family of Brands. Been here for going on 20 years now. So uh, that's just a drop in the bucket in terms of our total history. We started back in 1928, before my time, just a few years before my time. I, I just missed it. And uh, I can tell you more about that history. It's really a fun, uh, neat history. And, you know, we're making new history here, too, aren't we, with um, today's travel situation. So anxious to talk to you about that. Indeed. Uh, and um, in broad terms, uh, Globus is an international product. I mean, you've, you've got a, a, a footprint really globally, haven't you? But most of uh, your, your heart and most of your movement, or a large part of your, your movements, are, are in Europe. Is that correct? That's indeed correct, yeah. We go to 82 countries, seven continents, but our heart is in Europe, Tom. Uh, the majority of our business, uh, our customers, our travel, our product, and our operation and our start uh, is all in Europe. So that is how Europe goes, is, uh, is really how we fare um, year to year. So our heart and our, uh, our customers are definitely focus more in Europe, but we have a global footprint and um, brought among also four different brands, Globus, Cosmos, Monograms, which is independent travel, and our River Cruise brand, Avalon Waterways. And I, I believe um, both the independent travel brand and, and the River Cruises has been doing extremely well in recent years. They have, yeah, boy, they have been on a tear. You know, River Cruising overall has just experienced phenomenal growth double-digit growth year over year, and we were certainly on that track for 2020 to continue. And it, it's got so much appeal to, you know, bringing big ship cruisers into the heart of Europe and a more intimate experience. And then Monograms have been our, our fastest growing brand. It's independent travel. It packages all the benefits of group travel, but for an independent travel. And so it's really, it's the world's only true hybrid between the two. And that's tapped into a whole new market you know, led by younger boomers who, you know, want more of that independence. So you're absolutely right, Tom. Both had, had really been surging and, and pointing to the kind of the next generation of the Globus family of brands. Yeah, and, but I think you'll find, I mean, did you think, I mean, a lot of people speculate about this and we're, we're concentrating on the world prior to March 2020 at the moment and maybe the world in the future. I'm sure it will all come back. But I, I had a feeling that a lot of the growth that we would have expected to occur in the escorted tour market went into river cruising. Um, it's, it's, not a, it's not a dissimilar product insofar as you can get a total care package, but I imagine it's a lot more leisurely. Uh, do you think that the growth that would have been experienced in, in escorted tours went into river? We get that question a lot, Tom, and actually might surprise you that the growth is really not at the expense of escorted. We see it directly from big ship cruisers mm -hmm. who have, uh, in a way, graduated from the big ship experience and moved on. They've done, on average, six ocean cruises by the time they get to river cruising. So that's really, uh, that's the, um, where the river cruise passengers have really originated is from that. Now, a large number of river cruisers have taken escorted, uh, but they haven't really moved from it. They've, they're really migrating from uh, from big ships. And so we've seen growth complementary, you know, both in escorted and in river cruise as river cruise has grown. That's cool. Cool. I mean, it's, I mean, it, I think the group, the growth of the river cruise um, product uh, has been the astonishing thing in my lifetime. And it, it really has energized, I suppose, the total care package that uh, tour operators can deliver, particularly to the North American market. And this has had a huge appeal and a huge boom. And this, this has been, been great over recent years. Now, um, obviously, the situation is not what it was. Uh, we are in a, I don't think we're in a permanently new world, though it would be interesting to hear your opinion on that. Uh, we're in a very challenging situation. I, I'm not asking you to speculate on what's happened to Globus. I can say very clearly that from the European inbound industry, we've gone from uh, looking at what was anticipated to be a very good year, uh, particularly from North America. Um, most of the members who handle North America were looking for, you know, a reasonably solid 
double digit growth, by which I mean, you know, it was in excess of 10% the growth that they were anticipating this year. Uh, this is, uh, these, these prospects now um, are a distant memory. Um, there is functionally no product um, for an inbound industry in Europe. There is some injury European traffic, but that is, uh, that is slightly curtailed. Most of the um, business that we're seeing at the moment is um, domestic and possibly entry European within the big block Schengen area, which is effectively a domestic area. Um, I think, I suppose the question to you is, you know, when do you expect us to be able to claw our way out of it? And what do you think will lead it? Well, Tom, first of all, I've, I vowed never to use the word unprecedented again. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because <laughs> the, uh, the word, uh, so no doubt that this is, uh, so dramatic in terms of those of us that focus on international travel. And our focus has been on really surviving this period, doing our best to thrive so that we're ready. And the return, when it'll happen, we're expecting really 2021 to be a gradual return. I think more and more that's a realistic view. We're making plans to operate still in fourth quarter of this year. Uh, we both from a demand standpoint and from a uh, access standpoint, we know that if that happens, it will be a gradual return. It won't be an instant turn on the switch and, you know, off you go. There are some things that have to happen, of course, uh, for that to happen. Borders open, the uh, level four travel advisory here in the States to be lifted. Uh, air access, I, I believe, will follow demand once that happens, but that's another factor that we have to anticipate. In terms of us and our operation, you know, that, that's the piece that we feel the most confident about. Uh, we have protocols in place to operate in a COVID-19 world and, and we feel confident in that and we're ready for that scenario. It's the other factors, the opening, uh, the you know, working around the political fused, infused uh, situation with that and, and obviously as, as uh, governments and local jurisdictions figure out what is the right way to do this that ensures health of their own residents and travelers. So, but Tom, we're expecting 2021 to be, I guess in the best light, you could call it a bridge year where you know we'll see just continue to gradual return as things open up and as we figure out the health situation around COVID and you know, God willing, a vaccine that is widely accessible, which would be the real tipping point for a new surge. Now, getting through the short term and the challenges as a focus will have tremendous rewards on that back end of this. Mm. That, that we're already seeing the pent up demand, you know, from travelers already who the right of travel has been taken away from them. And that's a serious thing. And, and that's something that Americans take very seriously. And we are just really getting, you know, our wings under us in terms of that appeal and demand for international travel had been unprecedented. And so once, you know, we know from our own makeup that when something we want is taken away from us, that's the one thing that we are committed to getting back. And so there will be, you know, on the back end, I guess that's what everyone is building towards is there'll be a new era of growth. When that happens, 22, 23, you know, where we'll be ready. But um, if we can create survival tactics, really, I mean, that, that's a way to put it, to bridge this, this uh, low demand period and these restrictions period, then, um, you know, we'll, we'll be healthy on the back end. I mean, I think, I think you, you raised so many interesting points there. I, I, I think the thing I'll pick you up on, and it, it's, it's, a, it's, a real, it's a real issue, is how far the airlines are going to be helping. Um, and I, I just don't know. But I, one thing is for certain is that if you look at the previous slumps, and you're right, this is unprecedented. But um, if you look at things like 1986, and I fear I go back as far as 1986, um, and 91, and 2001, and 2007, 8, which were the big, all terrible years for tourism. Um, I think um, all the time when these events occurred, the airlines were really obliged to keep their schedules open. And it meant that there was a big supply of comparatively low cost lift moving between uh, North America and Europe. 
and it enabled uh, customers to use uh, sometimes very aggressively priced offers to access Europe quite easily. And I think what we may be looking at, and I'm answering the question for you, but we'll move on, but what what we're looking at is not a situation where airline capacity leads the recovery. I think we're going to be seeing a situation where airline capacity follows the recovery. And that's going to be a different picture. Is, is that roughly what you're saying? I think you're absolutely right with that. I, and, you know, we've heard from our airline partners exactly that, that it will follow the recovery. They'll, they'll fulfill demand when demand is there. They won't necessarily create demand. They're going to be yield driven and, and prices will follow. So there is a possibility that we will see just, you know, in terms of generating capacity for them that, you know, we'll see some very favorable pricing. But, uh, you know, it's about economics and, and the value per seat there. So, but I think you're absolutely right that things have to be open. Travel has to be open for business again, and then uh, they'll fulfill demand. Well, um, do you think um, a lot of people think that the um, the nature of demand is going to change as a result of this crisis? Um, uh, uh, they, they think that uh, people will be more attracted to the less uh, frequently occupied places, the more out of the way places, uh, and that this somehow chimes with a um, uh, you know an experiential message that a lot of us have been hearing about travel product. Um, and I'm wondering whether you feel this is the case, because there's a counter argument which says that demand is when it returns will look remarkably like the old demand. People will want to see the things they always see. Uh, well, what is your what is your take on that? So we have a undiscovered Europe product line that we've had in play, Tom, for three years now. So in a pre-COVID world, we were seeing amazing interest in that off the beaten path product, itineraries that were designed for that person who was maybe very familiar with a, a primary destination, a, uh, a Britain, a uh, Italy, uh, Mediterranean countries, but wanted that next level experience and, and to get off the, out of the main cities that they were more familiar with. So we were seeing huge growth there, 40, 50% to those destinations with that product line pre-COVID-19. So I think that there's just naturally, just organically, you know, demographically, there's demand, growing demand for experiences like that. But at the same time, Tom, we were experiencing growth in the tried and true destinations mm. as well. So I don't think it's one or the other is, is my answer to that, that there's a huge traveler base that will never get tired of Rome. That will never, it will never be too much London. It will never be, uh, wow, the, you know, those places are amazing volume driving, one of a kind destinations that will, will be the pipe pipers for Americans traveling to Europe. Then building on that is getting beyond. And, and I, think they, I think they go together, Tom. Now, will Undiscovered not suffer to the extent when borders are open, I think yes. I think that the undiscovered destinations will be an easier entry point back for folks to feel more confident, to feel more comfortable. I'd say river cruising fits in that category as well because you're by nature off the beaten path and, and in quaint towns and villages along the rivers instead of the, the larger city hubs. So it, it will be a factor returning, but I don't think there's a long-term, I really don't believe there's a long-term impact in in the major volume destinations. I, I think, um, I, for what it's worth, I was just talking uh, to one of the big Japanese operators and they were saying very strongly that uh, Europe has a USP and its USP is its principal historic towns and culture. And this is what people travel to see. Uh, nature for all its virtues is always available closer to home. Um, and this is, um, uh, this is the standard conundrum that we face. And uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering, um, do you think that there is going to be any other changes coming forward? I mean, are people going to go for smaller groups? or Because smaller groups sound fine, but you know and I know that smaller groups have their own problems, not least of which the yield. Uh, they cost much more to operate, for example. Uh, do you think there's going to be a demand for that? There, the majority of the mass market is really a price-driven 
market that, you know, to, price can be the ultimate motivator, Tom. And part of the benefit of escorted travel is you get such great value. And so that, that USP, that value proposition, is a big part of our volume. There'll be a smaller market that is more interested in you know, the smaller group experience. But as you point out, that comes with a price premium just because of operational costs with fewer numbers. So that's not going to be the long-term answer, I believe. We're not going to shift into permanent smaller groups. Is that, that the main motivator is going to be to what extent can a tour operator like Globus and Cosmos give value to a traveler so that it's a wise choice to go to Europe? And that is going to continue to be the major driver. And we're anticipating we've got to keep that value proposition intact uh, uh, through this period. And I think you know, that, that, that is going to be one of the big challenges. I think um, uh, the, the difficulty we've got, and um, uh, I, E2A together with USTOA and CATA put together this tool care program, um, which is a consumer facing reassurance program for tour operators to adopt. Um, but I think um, the main point behind that is actually not the customer reassurance. The main point behind that is that the customer has to feel that the experience is worth any risk. All travel involves risk. It all travel involves a leap into the unknown. But I think um, as long as we help them understand that the risk is minimized and minimal, they're going to go for the experience because at the moment Europe offers unbeatable, it will be offering unbeatable value in 2021. And it will also offer an unmatched experience because Europe will not be suffering from over tourism uh, this fall, this winter, this spring or next summer. Um, it's going to be, um, a sensational product to be selling on it. Okay, um, Steve, on that note, is there anything more you'd like to add? Well, one thing, you know, on that, that peace of mind and security that you just touched on, Tom, is more and more consumers are going to understand that no one travel entity can 100% keep them safe. Our, it's our responsibility to take every reasonable measure to take every precaution that we're minimizing risk, but ultimately it's a contract between the consumer who's willing to accept, you know, a level of risk and the supplier like us and the destinations themselves that are, are taking every reasonable precaution. Mm -hmm. And more and more you can see it as things open up here in the States that really is a balance between the two. And that's where I think things will start to normalize a bit in understanding that governments and entities cannot 100% regulate uh, consumer safety and well-being, that it's a balance between the two. And the economic well-being is getting to be as critical as the health and safety well-being. And so I think things overall just they, they will balance and they need to be balanced and we need to open and we need to get back out there and we need to let consumers share in this balance and have the right to make that choice if they accept the risk with suppliers like us and with entities like ETOA helping you know, deliver and put in place very reasonable measures to basically to do the best we can and take every precaution possible and, and let the consumers decide. Let the consumers decide. I think is a great f closing line. We're moving at the moment in a weird command economy where governments are deciding what consumers can do at the moment, in our world at any rate. And um, I think I might leave it at that, Steve. Leave that. Steve, thank you so Steve, much you. for joining us. Um, it's been great talking to you, and I look forward very much to seeing you again shortly. Thanks so much, Tom. I appreciate you having me. You take not, care. Not at all. Take care. Bye-bye.